Hi, Monique. Hi, Bill. How are Morning. you? So we Thanks have San Diego and we have New Jersey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> From Tel Aviv. Um, I, I, I'm just going to get started, you know, through your bios and telling me um, who you are, how you got into ESGs and the, and the sustainable finance world. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Monique, <laughs> let's, please tell us, ladies first. <laughs> okay, that sounds good to me. Um, so my background, I'll just share quickly, um, is, you know, I started my career in mainstream finance, conventional finance, as we refer to it, maybe even legacy, um, because the world is changing and we cannot do things the old way. But I won't let the cart get before the horse. Um, I went to Georgetown undergrad, went to business school at NYU, and, and, and when I was coming out of business school, impact investing as a field was, as a term, was not even coined yet. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do at that time, but I knew that I had still a lot to learn about how the world works and the way money flows, which is partly why I started on a career towards finance because I thought I was gonna be an ambassador. Mm -hmm. I wanted to join the foreign service until I um, learned more enough about it to know that I didn't want that anymore. So I did an internship program that was called Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, which basically changed my life. It was my first uh, taste of finance world. And I thought, well, there's even more that I don't know than I thought I didn't know when I got started. So I continued on that course for a number of years. I worked in New York and London, a number of investment banks along the way, went back to business school and um, you know, re-entered the investment banking world. I was in commodity derivatives for a number of years and thought, you know what? The, my purpose in life cannot be to help energy companies manage the volatility and their income statement and other kinds of companies. What more should I be doing with what I know and what I have access to? And I went on exploration. I thought about a PhD in strategy and quickly learned that that was not what I wanted to do, but um, impact investing was becoming a thing. And I thought, let me see how I can move towards that. I worked at the Clinton Global Initiative for a number of years, which was basically like a graduate education in the impactful themes. Um, put those two things together, my background in finance and those impact themes, and you have uh, a natural move to impact investing. So I spent some time at a boutique consulting firm called Tideline, which was trying to help folks thinking about um, starting or expanding their practice of impact investing to do that, uh, agnostic to the kind of structure and just trying to um, accelerate some of those models. I then went to Mission Investors Exchange, which was a network organization for entities looking to start or build a practice of impact investing, largely composed of foundations. And then from there, I joined my first friend in impact investing, Mr. Bill Burkhardt, who you'll be hearing from in a second, in this business that um, they created about five, six years ago, really thinking about systems. And I think that is where the conversation needs to be at this time in the field, uh, across legacy finance to the impact world to anyone else who moves capital around. Let's think about systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm also the co-founder of a nonprofit called Make Justice Normal. It's also thinking about systems change and really ultimately narrative change. How do we liberate our imaginations to understand that something else is possible and what are those things, um, among other ideas that we have. I'm also the co-founder of a fund called the Restarter Fund, which is a new idea trying to take shape um, to be an economic and justice-focused initiative around small businesses. So that's enough about me, and I also have a three-year-old, so kind of busy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like schools never really get you satisfaction regarding impact, and I'm happy to hear it, actually. Um, yeah, excellent. Congratulations. Um, Bill, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed. Like whenever I get to hear uh, the kind of retelling of Monique's background, I'm always just like, oh, I get to work with her. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so my, my start in this was uh, slightly different in the sense that, you know, uh, I don't know to what extent any of your listeners have heard of someone named Catherine Fulton. So Catherine Fulton was this kind of, it was and is um, this kind of icon in um, uh, innovative philanthropy and really thinking about what's next. And she she has this great TED talk where she kind of lays out this vision and, and her motivation for why she wanted to influence the philanthropic sector, particularly around the time that Monique was pointing to around impact investment getting coined and all that. And in her speech, she gives this photo of her like great grandfather. And she talks about how the lesson and the example that he set 
really is something that has cascaded through her life and it makes her reflect on what's the, what kind of world does she want to leave, you know, generations from now, you know, her ancestors a hundred years from now. Um, and, and I always thought about that as great because my, my motivation, my inspiration was the exact opposite. I had, was born and raised in this family that they were what we would call white cap developers where they would do, they would sit on boards, nonprofits, they'd, you know, uh, serve in town, town councils and things like that. Um, while all the, while doing a lot of you know private uh, real estate development type work in this area where they were able to kind of leverage the three sectors for really personal short-term gains, right? Um, and, and I remember that being this kind of thing where even as a young kid thinking, if we leverage the three sectors, we can actually really start to generate really effective, really sustainable change that betters everyone. Um, and that at a very young age was kind of instilled in me and, and it kind of cascaded through the rest of my career so far. And, you know, my work, similar to Monique, you know, I, I got into this um, thinking I would go the diplomatic route, which is funny. Um, and, and it was just, it was one of those things where as I started to get experiences, and all, you know, whether it was working for members of parliament, whether it was writing for a business journal in Shanghai, um, doing work for various nonprofits, um, I was always just kind of motivated by that. Like, how do we start to leverage these things better? And then eventually um, I had went and did my uh, master's at Johns Hopkins. And I studied under someone in particular, a guy named Lester Solomon, who just passed away last year. Um, just kind of this guru that thought about how to better uh, make the, the civil society, uh, private sector and government work more collaboratively, work, work better um, together. And so that work, was great. It kind of like gave me a basis of knowledge um, right around the time that impact investment was being coined. And I did uh, some of my kind of in, in this particular field, some of my first work experiences were with venture philanthropy partners, which is a kind of DC based philanthropic investment organization really focused on kind of applying the concepts of venture capital to philanthropy. Cause there was a lot of those guys that like the dot-com, you know, millionaires and billionaires that, you know, they, they found themselves at like the ripe old age of 32 and they had all this wealth and they're like, how, how do we do this better? Um, and so doing that work and then uh, a little bit of the ways in my mentor from, um, from grad school called me up and said, Hey, Hey, you know, I just uh, got the kind of green light on this major initiative to kind of put an analytical lens on all of these developments, the new actors, the new tools, the new issues that were emerging as philanthropy developed more of an investment orientation and investment developed more of a social orientation. And so I ran this initiative called the New Frontiers of Philanthropy Project um, out of Hopkins for quite a few years. And through that experience, you know, I connected with all the who's who that were doing really powerful, incredible things at the time, um, including uh, my current business partner, Steve Leidenberg, who is this kind of like icon in the sustainable investment industry. Um, he's been kind of at the forefront, for, you know, always ahead by five to 10 years of everybody else. And he had, he had reviewed a piece. Of, so I did this report for um, a group called Money Management Institute, a kind of big financial services industry body. And I remember still to this day, Steve and I sitting down at a, a Panera in Boston and being like, you know, it's fine. He's like, but what you're talking about is like 2.0 of sustainable investing. He's like, and he's like, what I'm thinking about is 3.0. And I said, well, what's 3.0? And he goes, systems. We got to think about systems. And I had, that resonated because when I was at Venture Philanthropy Partners, that was when I got exposed to Danella Meadows, thinking in systems, which is kind of the precursor to all of this. Um, and, and that set us off. I mean, we, we've been TIP, the investment integration <laughs> investment integration project. Um, I almost just forgot the name. And so we just get so used to saying TIP. Um, and, and we started that and, and have done the hard work of kind of uh, naming what we're talking about, building basic concepts and principles around it uh, based on evidence, um, and a lot of which we'll get into in this. But um, yeah, so that that's kind of, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I, I and mean, thank you, Bill. That's wow. I'm impressed. Congratulations, first of all, because it's like it's not easy. Um, and I, I have a question. I'm super curious. How was the, how was the market six years ago when you started? Uh, I mean, uh, like, yeah, crazy going on. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really great question. So, so I often refer to it as a, um, uh, not crowded intersection. 
if you think about it, right? So the, I could see another car coming up to the light on the other side of the road, you know, but um, it wasn't very crowded. And I would say that we, I remember the first couple of years, I mean, we had an initial business model that never went anywhere because we just, we miscalculated, like while people were interested in the terminology and they were fascinated by this idea of driving bigger fundamental change, um, they, you know, really getting their hands around it and understanding like, oh, this is something I can act on. This is something I can implement um, was I, it, in the early days, there, there wasn't a lot, uh, but it's amazing how big systemic crises, um, everything from the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, to the kind of growing acknowledgement around climate change as being this thing that we all have, we all have to not only grapple with, but grapple with it really quickly. Um, and then the pandemic. Uh, and Monique and Monique came on a tip right right as the pandemic basically was happening, and um, and it's crazy, right? Because it's like just even the in the last two years, the way the dialogue has changed on it is dramatic, and I think Monique would probably agree with that. One hundred percent, and not only that. I mean, my other side, Moonlight is as a contributing editor to Impact Alpha. That also is a bit of the story of impact investing growing into itself and becoming a thing while, you know, before our eyes as a, I mean, a, a sector to itself and not in a niche within mainstream finance or an asset class, which is where it was first called. But um, just these last handful of years, the awareness of systems is now undeniable for those who had a privileged position to pretend that systems didn't exist and that systems are not um, something we can do something about. When you speak about systems, how do you how do you see systems today from and where do do you think we, we're going through uh, you know within the next few years? Um, how do you how do you represent a system today? Yeah, yeah. So when we think about systems, I mean we're we're talking about those really big, complex, interconnected issues. Um, like like climate change, like income inequality, like financial system stability. These are these big things that are built up over millennia that they are constantly evolving and and they they're not easily addressed by any one investor. That really at the end of the day that we, and we've developed certain kinds of frameworks around this to help investors kind of get their hands around it to basically say, you know, if you're going to do this, if you're going to really try to attempt to influence these big things, these the context with which you operate in, I mean, that's fundamentally what we're talking about, um, that it's going to require you to have a deeper level of understanding of the root causes of these systems and where the kind of breakdowns are within them. It's, it's going to require you to think about as an investor, where can you actually effectively start to intervene? Some issues are just harder for investors to really have much influence on, whereas others, they lend themselves to it. Um, and it's also kind of this acknowledgement of thinking through the kind of sheer scale of these things and the uncertainty attached to it. So we're no longer talking about like, you don't necessarily mitigate the risk to these things, but you do try to manage it better and you're trying to essentially not you're you're investing in a way to deal with these kind of irreducible uncertainties that's the environment that you're operating in and so it's it's putting guardrails in place it's it's kind of trying to influence the resiliency of these things what it isn't though is oh we're gonna kind of add a couple of criteria to our security selection process or we're gonna add a couple of simple questions to a due diligence tear sheet because that's somehow going to while giving ourselves a better portfolio, it's not necessarily going to drive that larger scale impact. So when we think about systems, it's just, it's not only, it's an acknowledgement of the greater complexity and just interconnectedness and magnitude of these things, but it's also a greater acknowledgement of the unique role that investors can actually play to influence them, which is different from, you know, you look at SASB and you look at all these kind of materiality standards across all these different industries, that's, only the ones where that is cross-cutting, where it's like climate change, where it affects the gross majority of those industries, that's a systemic issue, right? Um, and it gets away from idiosyncratic beliefs and, and motivations and things like that. Like it really, there, there's a whole justification as to go into it. So anyways, that's what we mean with systems is that these are big, these are scary, <laughs> they're complex, <laughs> and they're constantly evolving. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking those 
types of questions because you know I've been, as I mentioned, you know, offline. I'm 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 exploring different groups um, online, including you know groups about sustainability professionals, and the debates there are just um, really um, various, and 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 we have various and multiple you know views and opinions regarding what is a real system and how would we consider. Uh, consensus, how do we see, you know, the future of the networks, um, including sustainable finance, and there are large debates about, you know, confronting, you know, one view to the other, including firms, representatives, and, you know, I, it's like, um, when you start exploring, because I do that, um, and I, and I um, relate that, you know, to my uh, reviews, and I, and I, and I get a lot of feedbacks, and I, I feel that the audience, and, you know, um, the different people that are uh, just interacting uh, with each other are talking about different things. Um, yeah. and, and, and there is a, an interesting point also when um, I started reading, you know, the letters, uh, annual letters from the CEOs, including uh, <laughs> Larry Fink's one. Um, you, you feel that there is a stretch in between what uh, the CEOs and the board members are considering as a system to be concrete and what's happening uh, on the market. Um, and and it's, it's realistically, politically, whatever you name it, uh, focused, but also it doesn't speak in terms of design thinking. What's about the future? Right. Uh, how are we gonna get you know, things done? And, and this, these are my questions you know, to, the, to experts like you, because you know better than anyone else what's going on on the market and how we can make it you know, through, through the crisis. So, um, and that, that totally resonates. I mean, you know, I think you can look at it both generously and cynically, right? So I think on one hand, for sure, like, I think that a lot of these institutions, they see the seemingly growing interest of, um, you know, the whole kind of range of potential investors that they might service. And so they think, well, you know, if I slap a few things on this and, and push, our, push it out there, that that's somehow going to generate more flow of funds into whatever products we're developing and, and services we're offering. Um, and that's, you know, we see that, right? Like we see that across the board, um, particularly across the management, asset management industry and, you know, financial advisory space. Um, I think generously though, what we can also point to is that this is not, there's a lot of art in this. It's not all science. And, and even in the last 10 years, while the, the standards and the availability of data and all of that has just dramatically increased, um, the regulatory environment is still catching up. It's clarifying things really quickly, which is great, but it's still catching up and it's certainly uneven across different regions. So there's that. Um, and I think one of the problems that, you know, particularly as we, you know, for the focus of this conversation is we try to say, okay, you've got to get beyond a portfolio focus to really one that focuses on systems, even understanding kind of how to do that. And that it's not simply saying, I want to influence systems because I know that it's going to be beneficial for our long-term performance. Um, it's not just about keeping that lens narrowed to portfolio construction or security selection, it does require starting to do other things, things that are not the traditional um, way of operating for a lot of these investors. So that's, that's also part of this, where it's to say like your toolkit is much broader than you ever thought. And, and it needs to be, if you're going to drive change at that level, just getting that kind of, you know, culturally in the financial system to get folks to understand that where their entire training, their entire way of operating for decades has been modern portfolio theory, which is predicated on neoliberal thought, which is like the markets will do everything. And then that, that opportunity will trickle out or trickle down to everyone else. Um, and that you don't have to collaborate to drive collective change, that you can really keep it just focused on how you're choosing assets. You can keep it focused on the short term, all of which I think is being put on, you know, tipped over on its head because we're realizing like, no, we're not going to actually mitigate the downsides of any of this or be able to seek the upsides of new industries and new markets and things like that if we don't start to act more co collectively. And we're not going to get there if, if all we're doing is doing, you know, we're picking better stocks. Like that's not going to get us to the change that we want. Um, 
so I think it's a little bit of both like and and you know I'm sure you know Monique and I have tons of conversations you see yeah. the the articles by the black rock guy you know we see it from you know Tariq we see it from Ken Pucker we see it from a lot of folks that thoughtful pieces that are kind of pointing out the disconnect but I think that there's more to that than than um than I think a lot of people often will consider and I don't know Monique you probably would agree with that I fully agree and and part of it is what matters? I think one thing that the pandemic in these last few years, racial reckoning, everything that's happened in these last two or so years have forced people to ask what matters in a different yeah. way. And real world outcomes are what matters. And there's an urgency that I think um, we didn't have before though lots of these problems preceded and systemic weakness was there and systemic harm to specific groups has always been there. Um, but now we, see it, folks are naming it. And um, we, due to climate change in particular, have an urgency around solutions that we haven't had before, which means if we do things the way you did before, you'll get what you had, right. which was nearly broken just a minute ago. So what else? Um, perhaps there is an openness because of this um, to considering, hmm, maybe it's possible that our ways of work aren't good for humanity, aren't good for the planet. So what do you have to acknowledge about that in, in terms of your own complicity and being part of the system? You know, I was part of the investment banking world, high finance and all of these other things. Um, how can we allow people to be on this journey to learn that something else is possible, but also not that it's possible and we can't just have rumination. We have to have action because if we don't meet these goals, well, what's going to happen? Do you think the financial world is somehow re responsible for the lack of um, I don't know if, it, if we can speak about diversity or belonging, but the cultural aspect of sustainability as we speak. I mean, we're all in, in the processes, in all the uh, individualism that we saw, you know, for the past 20 years regarding um, investment, asset management, etc. It's a, it's a tough question, I, I, I admit it, but um, I don't want to blame anybody specifically, but I'm trying, you know, to better approach and better understand what's going on with the mindset that we need to adopt, you know, for the next few years, uh, particularly for yeah. the insurance uh, world. Yeah, you know, I, I often think about this. Um, so one of the big kind of pockets of innovation in the industry has been around the circular economy. And it's that whole idea of moving from a kind of linear consumption model to one that is regenerative by design. Um, just getting that, and that's, you know, that's had the backing of the World Economic Forum, McKinsey, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I mean, there's been a lot of effort, a lot of high profile folks that have been pushing it. And it's really starting to, catch, to take hold. But, you know, just go back a few years ago, people were still like, particularly in the investment world, beyond debt, no one was taking it seriously and no one was really doing anything even though people could point to it, be like yeah you've got some upfront r d investments on this but like ultimately this is going to make more resilient investments it's going to be a sector of the future kind of thing and just even in the kind of environmental finance space environmental investment space just like it, it was still kind of just this interesting thing but like no one could really get their hands around it that's part of like how just companies work and how they invest in R&D. And a lot of that has been shrunken because investors typically value more short-term gains. They value short-term um, uh, benefits. When you think about that, why is that? And it's that way because yet again, it's, it's, they're grounded in a kind of thinking and principles that just don't lend themselves to this idea. Yeah, they operate individually. And they're paid to operate individually. They're incentivized to operate individually. Um, they they are they think short term because that's how they're like judged. Is if they don't meet certain standards or certain baseline um, performance, that who cares what happens three years from now, five years from now? They're getting measured today, you know. And so I think there's there's a lot of that where it's to say sustainability generally and, and even a greater systems focus. I don't think any, anybody intuitively thinks that these things are wrong or not useful to consider or integrate, but we're running headlong into a financial system that has really struggled to make sense of it, 
um, make a decision useful, and then create the kind of context and the enabling environment that is going to really drive greater adoption by the investment community more generally. And so that's where like, we can point to Europe as being this kind of bright spot because the things, all the pieces came together, right? And just in the last few years with various regulatory developments, it's finally making it so that it's like, this is table stakes, right? That's not true when you get to a lot of parts of Asia. That's not true when you get to Latin America. And in the US, we're kind of getting there, <laughs> but but it's it, it's not fully true yet. Um, and so it's like, when you start to think about that, there, there's a real reason why there's been this kind of slow uptake by the sustainable, uh, by of sustainable investment by the broader mainstream financial community. Monique, please tell us. I'm curious. I'm, I'm totally agreeing with <laughs> everything you said, and I'm only adding, you know, when you don't, when you cannot be motivated intrinsically, you're motivated by something outside of yourself, right? What have we, what have we stamped in the culture of how we do things that will prevent us from doing the right thing? Um, in the financial services industry, particularly as Bill just so eloquently said, um, we value people activities on their short, shortest term possible. And we've told everyone the most important thing you can do is maximize your profit to yourself and to your ent the entity that you happen to work for. Does that serve us in the long run? Will that serve us to not be able to choose extinction? Because we can short term, ex short term incentivize ourselves into meaninglessness. I was I was I was just um, explaining the fact that um, I was interviewing you know back in time uh, different people from different countries in in Asia including China and, and India, and their aspect of sustainability how they represent it is totally different because of their cultural aspects first of all and the fact that they accept diversity and consider belonging in a very different way. So even at the bank or insurance or asset management level, uh, when you speak, you know, to different firms, even, you know, the same firms from one country to the other is totally different from what we have in Europe or in, in America. And, 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 and when they approach the issues, and probably I think that, um, you know, they encountered uh, most of the issues, you know, on their side, much more than what we have, you know, in Europe or uh, in America. It's, it's really different because they know how to approach and how to address challenges, but also how to consider the system that is broken and how to fix it in a very, very different way. Um, and, and, and what I've learned, you know, so far when I get feedbacks from, from, from people, you know, from different universities um, or different academias or whatever we, we think, you know, in terms of approach and, and research and design thinking, I think that the, the, the tip here is to set up a new mindset on our side um, to consider how we can use and give back on that plane, particularly on the, on the diversity um, aspects, because I think that what's lacking in the, in the, in the financial world uh, as we approach it is, is, the, is the diversity and cultural aspects. And that's, that's, really, that's really meaningful at, at, at that stage, I think. Yeah, oh, 100%. And I mean, what you're identifying is one of the kind of higher levels of change when we think about kind of leverage points within systems dynamics, changing mindsets, changing culture, and, and basically shifting paradigms. That's, that's the gold standard. Like if you can do that, then, then all of the other, the regulatory stuff, the actions that people can take, the kind of dimensions that they might emphasize building up, you know, to make sure that feedback loops are stronger, like all of that, all of that becomes not easier to do, but more effective to do if you've actually altered mindsets. You know, Monique talks about some of her side hustles and one of mine is something called Colorful Capital. So it's this kind of uh, LGBTQ plus focused fund that is identifying members of the community to invest in basically as a way to address the kind of inequality divide for the LGBTQ plus community. And one of the things that we're finding, particularly for, you know, think about like trans founders where they have, you know, the, that oftentimes that just building credit or when due diligence is done on them, you know, a lot of this, like their track record, everything is based on their dead name, 
yeah. and and that they've made this transition. And so when you have a situation where that like the financial system doesn't really account for things like that, um, we've interviewed a number of founders similarly where they talk about you know just finding vendors that are open and understanding will work with different members of the community. Culturally, that's still, you know, that's still gray space in the financial industry. And, and they've they face a lot of adversity in terms of just raising basic capital for, for these um, initiatives. That speaks to that, you know, and it, that, that's a like isolated example of the larger kind of cultural change that has to happen within the financial community. So it's it's stuff like that. And then it gets into a lot of those other things around short-termism, around kind of value extractive behaviors, things like that. Um, and I, all of which that I know Monique has been exploring with her work with the reconstruction and and her her other organizations. I don't know, Monique, if you want to say a few on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the reconstruction was a podcast that I hosted, which was about moving capital towards justice. And when you talk about, um, you know, emerging markets, frontier markets, and who's most proximate to where um, some of these the outputs of our failures of this global financial market happen and hurt most. Um, and when we think about capital being a proxy for power, who's, who's had it, who's created these systems that we have and we are inheriting other people's um, imagination of what they wanted it to be. So the distribution and how we do it um, is based on who folks wanted to win when they set it up. Um, the colonial legacy of some of these things, the white supremacy legacy of in, a, in the United States in particular. And so when we see the harm being meted out by these systems and our failure to consider climate, because it has been not proximate to the people who are powerful. Um, so when you talked about folks around the rest of the world kind of getting it more, um, because they've also kind of suffered at the hand of it. And, and so therefore, are more sensitive in some ways. Certainly they have their own internal dynamics around power and marginalized communities in any country that you wanna pick or any place that we wanna talk about. But um, when we design for the systems change, we have to design for the most marginalized. So we lift the floor, not just the ceiling of what we activities we ought to be doing and who we need to focus on in order to allow more people on the planet to thrive. And no longer is climate change over there. I think that's what has been the luxury position of a lot of folks in the global north. Um, the impacts are over there, but now they're here. Here, wherever you happen to be, there's floods, there's fires, there's anything, any number of things, frequency of these issues. And so now we're all proximate and we're all hopefully thinking about um, distributions of power and listening to communities in ways that we didn't before. Yeah. or certain people didn't. And um, can we acknowledge that this might be a moment that we can get it right this time, but it needs to be intentional and we need to be thinking in systems in order to do it and engaging in different activities like Bill talked about before, working community, that's not something that's the domain normally of um, financial services industry. We think about community building, we think about democracy organizing and community organizing. That's not usual for folks um, in the financial services industry, but we'll need to do things differently to make uh, large scale change possible. How do you convince the board members that have been so much involved in the fact, in that legacy of one linear view and vision and philosophy? How do you imagine the change happening on their side? What should we yeah. do as, you know, as community representative, as, as, as people that are fighting, you know, for diversity and belonging, but also, you know, new cultural aspects. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, tell me. Yeah, so, so it, it happens in a couple of ways. I mean, we did, it's funny, even just, so we did, a, we published a book last year on what we do. Um, and even the challenge of crafting that to say like, what are the arguments or what's the case making that we've done over the course of seven years at TIP um, that's gonna, that's the most effective distillation of how, like, how to make this case and, and how to help investors essentially integrate this focus. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can talk about and in which investors, in, to Monique's point, you know, the threat of climate change, the threat of income inequality, the threat of financial system stability, these are things that 
you know, they've all happened in the relatively recent past. And so I think there's enough of these things where it's like, people are like, this is a once a millennia thing. And it's like, but it's happening multiple times in a decade. So, so it's when, when that starts to happen, I think it, it becomes, um, even if the empirical evidence or the modeling hasn't caught up yet to capture the real downsides to that, investors are feeling it. They're feeling the unpredictability. They're feeling the uncertainty attached to it. For us, you know, we make that case where we say we will help dramatize like, you know, the uh, instability creative, the instability to markets based on social unrest or the instability to markets based on climate change. And we can make that case. And there's a lot of evidence out there that speaks to it. I think one of the other things we often point to the work of John Lacomic and Jim Hawley, who really shown a light on this idea that, you know, 90% of the variation and returns that an investor faces is really due to the performance of the entire market, of the entire economy, not due to individual stock selection. And so if you are, in particular, if you are an institutional investor, a big one, like a pension fund or an endowment, an insurance company, sovereign wealth fund, and you have a long-term focus. And when we say long-term focus, if you are a pension fund, you have a 75-year horizon that you're going to have to pay out beneficiaries. Um, GPIF, the biggest pension fund in the world in Japan, it refers to itself not just as a long-term investor, but as a super long-term investor, because you know their horizon is over a century. So when you think about that and you match the kind of growing instability due to these big issues, matched with the, the basic evidence that suggests your, your performance is going to be based on things that you weren't really considering before, that's helping. And I think the more that we can build up that evidence. And, and one thing I would say is that Moni can speak a bit more to it. We've been doing this industry needs assessment work for about six months, this project um, with UBS Optimus Foundation and Humanity United, where we, we've been really exploring kind of level of awareness of system level investing and the need for that focus and the kind of challenges, opportunities, breakthroughs needed to get more segments to move in that direction. And Moni can talk a little bit about what we've been hearing on that, because I think it's, I think it speaks to what you're asking. So Moni. Yeah, sure. And, and I think even the gin just came out recently talking about ESG is just good hygiene because it's just, it makes sense. It's good business. These are risks. They're real. Mm. And can you mitigate them, do something about them, consider them, you will be better at your thinking. Uh, some of it is math, but to um, Bill's earlier point, some of it is art, but what do you need to change about how you think in order to think this way? Um, I think it's uncommon, you know, when we start talking to folks, after we say it out loud and we have this specific articulation of system level investing, they're like, it's intuitive. I get it now. I, it makes sense to me once I put all of these pieces together, but now what? Um, I think what um, Bill and Steve's book, 21st Century Investing, really does is trying to get people outside of their baggage of, we called it this other thing and I can't do that and I'm not that and the labels of like, am I this kind of investor or that kind of investor? Am I an impact investor? Am I, what are the, all these labels? Well, do you care about the long run? Yes, let's go. <laughs> That's what I think the book ultimately does for folks is allow them a way in when we are enmeshed in these debates like you referenced earlier on the minutia. Do we care about the long run? Yes, let's go. That's what I would like folks to get to. And then enter a couple of um, tools that TIP is literally building based on you know this industry needs assessment that um, Bill was just talking about. Yeah. What have folks told us exactly they need? They need bite-sized pieces of information that help them grapple with this very big idea called system level investing and gives them a step-by-step -step way to adjust your strategy. And some of adjusting your strategy includes what are the rules of the road that don't allow me to do what's right? Well, we must change those, don't we? Isn't that what's next? Well, won't, don't we have to then change those is the question. Um, and so what of governance do I need to change? What about my, um, what about, what does my board now need to agree to if I'm structured in that way? What do my trustees need to agree to so we can actually adapt our strategy to this very intuitive way of thinking that systems matter, the context matters. I can do something about it, and I need to do different things in order to do something about it. There is an interesting point here. Sorry to interrupt you about you know the taxonomy and the publications that I see you know on social media. A lot of firms are publishing their taxonomy, their vision about ESGs, how they consider it, and at that level, I think that you know everybody and his own her goals uh, regarding whatever is going to happen with uh, uh, sustainability finance. But the thing is that I am trying to better understand how a global movement, how can we raise awareness 
um, to align, you know, all the visions and all the politics that we need to address. And on the other side, we have the policymakers, the decision makers, the board members that are over pressuring towards, you know, better incomes. Um, and, and, and growth and productivity. And here is the stretch because I'm trying, um, you know, all along, you know, the past year and probably even before um, when, we, when we read whatever it was published, you know, 20 years ago about reporting and sustainable finance, blended finance, it was already here on the market, but no one wanted to recognize it. Um, and now we figure out that since the pandemic, as you mentioned, Bill, um, we need it. It's urgent. I mean, the emergency is here. Um, how can we recreate that distribution level? How do we? Uh, sh how should we consider ESGs if ever we can deploy it? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's, it's a good question. I mean, you know, we're, we're asking that question. How do you both reimagine capitalism and yeah. then move everyone towards that new vision? Um, and I think that you know what we've discovered in this industry needs assessment is really for different segments of the community, it's gonna require different things. And we just have to kind of really get comfortable with that complexity. And I, and I think it's, it's you know, we see this now, we see, it, you know, part of what we're trying to do is this whole idea of this focus on system level investing. And if you think of this as kind of one component of the broader conversation around rethinking capitalism and, and sustainable investing and all of that, that there's, it's, um how this will unfold, I, I think we're still figuring that out because if you think about it, we've been in this, what we call this like, period of uncoordinated innovation. So there's been these interesting pockets of activity, whether from academia, whether from inv individual investor action, whether from various overarching initiatives and associations, it, people are nibbling at this in different ways, um, but nothing that has been kind of comprehensive, coherent to you're doing this, so we should do this. and how do we collectively move this together? Um, that's been lacking. And so part of what we've been trying to do, and we've been doing this in partnership with a number of different players to basically say, we need to build this market. We need to figure out how we're going to build this market. And what that means is, you know, to Monique's point, it's yeah. going to be addressing some of the cultural things around implicit bias. It's going to be creating that regulatory enabling environment. It's going to be making sure that the big wirehouses are actually dis distributing products that speak to the systemic focus to make sure that there's education and training so that like financial professionals are not looking at this like what in the world what are these you know it takes the heebie-jeebies away from it right it's it's all of these things that have to actually happen and then at the end of the day asset owners that's our theory of change if they don't start to demand it it won't happen. And so, so part of where we focus, that's where we focused our efforts to basically say, this is not um, jeopardizing your fiduciary duty. This is actually, if you take more of a kind of a pluralistic ethical framework, this is actually shoring up your fiduciary duty. Um, and that it's ultimately going to create that better long-term performance that Monique was talking about. Yeah. Um, all of that, right? And so we've just we've chosen there. Others have chosen the data part. Others have chosen the regulatory part. But I think making sure that we're all coordinated better and working in tangent, that's the thing that's been lacking. I think if we can do that, we're going to start to see a more accelerated and effective pursuit of that broader vision that you're talking about. Yeah, Monique mentioned that also. I, I you know, I, I, I imagine much more of a, an exponential view uh, within the next few years, just by collaboration and through, through new platforms, because we need the platforms from one side, from the government point of view, but also, um, you know, the private uh, sector needs to invest there. Um, and what I mean here is we can't, we need to balance all the time. And I see here also in the Middle East, how it goes, um, you know, the consideration towards impact is really di radically different. Uh, for the, first of all, you know, uh, Israel is a country where we are used to help each other, you know, at the basis, but also we're trying to deploy, you know, forces when it comes, you know, to, uh, to dramatic um, events all over the world. And I imagine that it's also, you know, the same in Europe and, and in America. But the thing is that here where um, I've learned, you know, over the past few years, also being in touch with, uh, with um, globally at the global level, um, the movements are not uh, difficult to deploy. What is difficult is about the human consideration and the political aspects 
at a higher level, but because when it comes to help each other, it works. Um, we probably have, you know, a disconnection when it comes, you know, to different types of groups with different types of visions and different types of goals. And the judgment and the decision making is, of course, different. Uh, but when we when we point out what is the problem, the specific problem, and define it in a in a very specific way, the level of, of consideration is totally different when it comes to investment. Um, and, and I saw well, that. And, and, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, not to interrupt, but but the one thing I would say this is why. So there's something. So the big development over the last you know uh, six to twelve months was the creation of the ISSB, the International Sustainable Standards Board. Yeah. That is the most not sexy thing to talk about, right? It's it's just like, oh great, the accounting standards are now going global, right? Except that it's so it's so important, and I can't I can't underemphasize it because it 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 gets it gets everyone to a baseline. Yeah, that's the point, right? And what we haven't had is that kind of consistent, coherent baseline. Yeah, people are gonna put, and that's the science part, right? Then the art part comes in. Okay, now here's how we make it even better. Here's how we can build on that foundation. Blah, blah. That the fact that think about this, this is an industry that's been around for decades, and it's just now that we're getting that. I mean, it, it, and, and think about the progress we have made, but like the progress that we haven't made because we haven't had that. So anyway, so so it's that thing, and the fact that CFA Institute now offers a certificate in yeah. ESG, right? Like, I mean, these are those things where you're like that's changing the DNA. That's where we start to get to that fundamental stuff. Sorry to interrupt. I just, oh, no, no, what you were saying, I was like, yeah. <laughs> that's great. But uh, you, you, you even mentioned that uh, the, the IS is, SSB, you know, is going to make his, their, their work, you know, towards a standardization and policies. But what's next? And that's always my question. What's next is going to happen? Um, are we going to deploy these systems, um, these, these talented standards and policies into the systems? Or how are we gonna need to consider new systems, or remake them, or fix them in a way? So what, what's what's the next step? What should we do here? Yeah, yeah. So so when you start to get something like that in place, it then opens the door for us to, in the same way that what SASB was started to, which is obviously now part of this, was to say, okay, now if we want to start getting a look at systemic risks. Now, because we have standardized data across all of these different industries, we can now start to pinpoint what of those different human natural capital issues, like what are those things that cross cut across all of these industries? And once we can basically say that, right, so without beyond a shadow of the doubt, we can now pin to point to these issues having a material impact on these, these the gross majority of industries. That's when we start to understand this is systemic in nature. And the moment we understand that it's systemic in nature, then we now understand, okay, there are different things that we have to do if we're going to actually start to effectively manage that and actually improve it. Um, so you have that next step for anybody that's doing the standard setting is to start looking across these things, to start identifying which of those issues are consistent across the majority of these industries. Um, at the same time, it is. It's saying, okay, there's now an ESG certificate for sustain for ESG um, by CFA Institute. Let's create a system level investment one. Let's then adapt that and make it a curriculum that academic programs around the world can start to integrate into um, into courses. Um, let's make sure that as we start to solve for standards and we start to solve for education, then let's start talking about the regulatory environment. The UK has put together what they're calling stewardship codes. In it, they actually call attention to systemic risks. The SEC just pushed out something that for private equity, that essentially you need to start managing systemic risks. More of those types of interventions that are going to ultimately incentivize, but also create that enabling environment are going to be important. For our part, a lot of this goes back to how do you start to build out, continuing to build out the kinds of turnkey and plug and play solutions that investors just take for granted and every other industry or every other function that they might operate in that don't yet exist for this. And so we're creating that now. And then we're also driving hard on creating a community of practice. You gotta be able to share best practices. You've got to share where are those needed innovations? How do we make sure that when the next proxy season comes up that more, more uh, proposals are coming through that require systemic considerations? It's, it's all of that that has to not only be churning but it has to be churning in better coordination that's what's next. That's where we have to get. If we're going to build this market, that's where we have to get to next. And so there's a lot of that foundational work that's kind of 
being done now or is soon to be done that I think is going to enable that next kind of jump um, in how we all act on this. Yeah, you mentioned um, yeah. this idea that we need a new shared North Star. And I think that is one um, real contribution of naming something. It is now we have something to get behind and it's bigger than like the little pieces of the conversation that's happening in disparate um, places. And then, and, you know, my vertical, your vertical, my asset class, you know, different structures. We can't all agree on these same things because the, my take on it will be different based on my incentive structure and all these other kinds of things. Well, what's the one level up? Can we get to the one level up from that? And I think that is a real contribution of system level investing because now it says um, these other words that we can quibble about, can we focus one level up? And if we do that, in one degree, if you point, point your feet in a different direction, one degree, in a mile, you'd be in a very different place. So it's not, it's not necessarily huge, but it is a, an important shift that allows us to be in one mile collectively in a very different place. And then the activities that will fall from that new one level up intention change and will force us to change. Um, and so we're hopeful that as we educate the field, as we roll out our new um, plug and play tool that Bill just referenced, that it has a real contribution that folks can begin to journey by themselves so that we can do this more at scale and not have to talk to everybody one on one in order to have a conversation so that folks can learn about system level investing. Um, that folks can start to learn by themselves as we create other certificates and more formalized structures. Where do we go now? Because part of it is that, um, you know, an education program that's going to change the people who are willing to go to school in a handful of years after they formally get a whole program together and all these things. But what can we do now to get folks who currently have jobs in this sector to do something differently? And hopefully, you know, this contribution that TIP is going to be rolling out soon can be part of that. Excellent. What types of tools can we imagine? What types of technologies are right now lacking on the market? What should we deploy? What startups should create? I mean, at that stage. Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, a lot of it speaks to, and this is part of like how tip things were to say, there are things that investors are going to need to do that is not their traditional way of doing things but a lot of it is and so it's thinking helping them think through how do you start to change your investment belief statements and investment policy statements to adjust for this how do you start to upgrade your manager selection or advisor due diligence process to consider systemic considerations um, how do you rethink corporate engagement so that this is also part of it um, and then if you think about kind of evaluating progress in terms of measurement and reporting, how does this start to get reflected in it? So part of it is it's making sure that the kinds of um, templates, kind of guided implementation, as well as, you know, the, the mechanisms that they need to kind of generate internal buy-in, all of these things are kind of part of a broader platform that, you know, both that to Monique's point that investors need to be able to tap into so they can choose their own adventure and that they can kind of get the support they need to go through that implementation process, which is going to require coordination internally across not only internal stakeholders, but consultants and all these other people to kind of fulfill it. So that's part of it. I think another part of it is we get a lot of questions around like, what's the perfect system level investment? Like tell us a system level investment fund. And, we're, and our thing is always, that's part of it. You wanna be looking for sectors that like circular economy that are embedding this kind of thinking in the core of like how they do business. Um, but it's also really helping them understand how to harness these other sorts of things around collab collaborative engagement. So sharing best practices, all of that. Um, creating the kinds of platforms that are going to allow them to, um, to, you know, around a particular issue, like say water, you know, what are the kinds of industry heat maps for that? What are some of the modeling that's going to get them to understand how integration of this consideration is going to play out um, in terms of their value chain and performance? Um, and then kind of understanding what the market of opportunity looks like across asset classes, that sort of thing. Um, getting them to kind of focus on the data infrastructure so that that the data so a lot of 
system level data that's out there is not necessarily been translated for investors. And so a lot of what's currently available needs to start to, that thinking needs to migrate now so that it's decision useful for investors in a way that it hasn't been. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff where it's, it's these are those things that I think will we're going to be pushing on some of those. Others will be pushing on other components of it. But that's the kind of stuff that I think has been largely absent or kind of underway, but that will be critical if, if that pivot's going to be made. Monique, you want to add something? Uh, no, I think Bill really captured it. And, and part of it is also uh, hearts and minds. Like, where is the inspiration? Where is, like, um, the part that is, uh, allows people to get outside of a working group and thinking about these very pedantic parts of it that instead will ca cause people to be inspired to also do whatever change makes sense given their own expertise and domain. Uh, so, you know, I think there's an element of that that deals with literally art and, um, you know, inspiration, things that get you into the other side of your brain out of the financial and mechanical part of this that allows you to be inspired. Uh, I don't know what that is, but I think that's part of it too, because this is a long haul and it is things like music and, and art that gives us the strength and, and fortitude to keep going when we have a complex problem that's going to, you know, be a multi-decade endeavor or the rest of our careers and that of those who come behind us. So what's going to give us the energy to stay that course? And folks have to find that intrinsic motivation as we talked about before, because focusing on this kind of change will not be easy, but we must do it. Right, I agree. Well, wow, thank you so much, guys. I think we're gonna have another interview uh, soon because I have plenty of questions. <laughs> I know. And you were so great. So uh, I have, indeed, I have a lot of questions in real leadership and more of uh, ESGs. And I think that you have a lot to share. Um, and thank you so much, highly appreciate. Um, Thank you for the opportunity. This was this was fun. I, Monique and I don't often get to do these together, so I, it's always fun to get to do this kind of stuff. Her, I think um, definitely that's going to be a second part with Bahovita. <laughs> well, we're we're game. So yeah. and 